Right now on Morning News Now, a short-lived showdown in the Senate. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas spared from impeachment after Democrats quickly dismissed charges over his handling of the migrant crisis. What we saw today was a microcosm of this impeachment since day one. Hallow, frivolous, political. He's probably the least effective and, and I think most dangerous in terms of his policy implementations uh, of any cabinet secretary in the history of the United States. And in the House, Speaker Mike Johnson facing the fallout within his own party over foreign aid. We'll bring you the latest from both chambers. Also, campus concerns. Columbia University's president grilled on Capitol Hill in the wake of recent anti-Semitic incidents on school grounds. The tense testimony raising questions about free speech. Plus, it's a hidden ingredient that could be harming your health. Researchers finding high levels of pesticides in your produce. What you need to know before your next trip to the grocery store. And a shared struggle. A majority of college students say they're feeling emotional stress. But one group says earning a degree doesn't have to take a mental toll. More on the problem and possible solutions. I promise there really are solutions which is so important when we have that conversation. Good morning, I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for joining me on the day before Friday. Joe's off this morning. We're gonna get started with that impeachment showdown on Capitol Hill. The Senate quickly dismissed two articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas brought by House Republicans over his handling of the U.S. border. Senate Republicans slammed the upper chamber's decision not to have a trial. Are we about to set a precedent that the allegation of a felony is not a high crime and misdemeanor. That is not an appropriate parliamentary inquiry. You don't have to be Mensa material to know that it's the not Senator only will state a high motion. crime and misdemeanor, it is a felony. For more, we are joined by NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali. Ali, good morning. So walk us through what happened on those impeachment votes. Tell us more. It was a little bit wild there last afternoon, uh, Savannah, because what we saw on the Senate floor is the Senate do what it was always going to do, which is dispense with these articles of impeachment. It was just the question of how they ultimately ended up doing that. Senator Chuck Schumer really kicking down the two legs of this chair, first going after the first article of impeachment, which is willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law. Schumer arguing that that was not constitutional. His colleagues, all Democrats and one Republican who voted present, agreeing with him. That toppled Article 1. And then Article 2 went down in the same fashion. What took a while was the Republicans trying to make various motions to adjourn or prolong this. Ultimately, those efforts failed, and it left both leaders of the Senate on the Republican and Democratic side warning of the precedent that this would set for two very different reasons. Watch. To validate this gross abuse by the House would be a grave mistake and could set a dangerous precedent for the future. This process must not be abused. It must not be short-circuited. History will not judge this moment well. So certainly a lot of talk about precedent there. Of course, this was a really rare moment in the first place. The first time a cabinet secretary was impeached in about 150 years, the Senate doing, again, what we expect them to, which is motioning to dismiss this. Absolutely. Ali, let's talk about another issue going on in the House, House Speaker Johnson's plans for foreign aid. He's facing a divided party, including members that want to oust him from his job. Johnson told members that they should expect to vote on separate aid bills for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan this weekend. A little confusing since Johnson himself had voted against Ukraine funding before he took the gavel yeah. six months ago. So what changed and what is it going to take for this aid to pass? What do you expect to happen? Namely, his title, Savannah. He is no longer just Congressman Mike Johnson. He is Speaker Mike Johnson. And I do think that that's a large part of what we're seeing here, especially as the majority of this House Republican conference does want to see the, the Congress push forward on this package of foreign aid. Now, it's a different fashion of doing it. Initially, the Senate had passed a supplemental aid package weeks ago that had all of these variety of, of aid pieces in it. Now, what Speaker Johnson is doing is basically just breaking them up. You get an up or down vote on Ukraine aid, you get 
an up or down vote on Israel aid, an up or down vote on Indo-Pacific aid. And then there's this fourth package that includes a lot of Republican priorities on combating foreign adversaries. There's things in there that Democrats like. I was talking to one congressman this morning on Way Too Early who said he loved the idea of how TikTok was being included in that. But then, of course, Democrats are also skeptical about whatever border provision is included in that. They're reading it very closely, but by and large, the expectation is that this will pass in bipartisan fashion. Here's something important to remember, though. Even though the plan is for up or down votes on all of these various aid pieces, they have to first get on to the actual business of voting for those. And in order to do that on the House floor, you have to vote for the rule. The rule is usually something that the majority party does by itself. That is not what we expect to happen today, and that could endanger Mike Johnson's job. Yeah, let's talk more about the potential danger that his job is in. So actually, we understand in an effort to shore up support, Johnson met with former President Trump last week in Florida. Could that protect his job? And do Democrats want to work with Johnson or in an election year? Would they see, would they like to see more infighting within the Republican Party? Like, is this a good thing or a bad thing for Democrats? How does this play out? First on the Trump of it all, I think that what we saw between the speaker and the former president was more of a side hug than a full embrace. And it's not clear that it's done anything to dissuade Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is not just a chief ally of the former president, but right now the chief antagonist of the Speaker of the House. She said she's going to wait until after the foreign aid package to push any kind of motion to vacate. That means that today is a really important day in Congress, but certainly over the weekend as well. It's going to be difficult for people like us, Savannah, who are now going to have to compete with watching Congress and also listening to Taylor Swift's new album. I am just really stressed. I was just waiting to say to you, happy new Taylor Swift <laughs> album day since I know you celebrate and observe. I love oh, it. Ali Vitale covering so much <laughs> and in preparation for this album, it really is something. We appreciate it, Ali. Good to see you. Let's turn out of the House probe into allegations of anti-Semitism on college campuses. The president of Columbia University was the latest college official to testify before the Republican-led Committee on Education and the Workforce. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haake has more. Columbia University, again a flashpoint in the rise in anti-Semitism on college campuses. As pro-Palestinian protests continue across the country and Jewish students report being targeted or feeling unsafe. I feel a tremendous amount of hostility towards me. Columbia's leadership testifying before a House committee investigating its response to recent incidents of anti-Semitism. President Manu Shafiq says that's included curtailing access to campus and stiffening penalties for unapproved protests. Anti-Semitism has no place on our campus, and I am personally committed to doing everything I can to confront it directly. Absolutely. Administrators pressed to respond to some of the most appalling examples of anti-Semitism. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Columbia's code of conduct? Mr. Greenwald. Yes, it does. Ms. Shipman. Yes, it does. Dr. Shafiq. Yes, it does. Columbia's leaders clearly prepared after the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard's presidents stumbled over the same line of questioning last year, ultimately resigning their posts. That calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard code of conduct, correct? Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. Some questioning focused on work and commentary of certain faculty members. The support of terrorism is acceptable if you're a Columbia professor? Not at all. Some Democrats criticized the Republican-led committee, noting they've now held three hearings on anti-Semitism on college campuses and none on bills designed to combat the problem. All right, Garrett Haig, thank you so much. Well, former President Donald Trump is due back in a Manhattan courtroom this morning as jury selection resumes in his criminal hush money trial after an off day yesterday. So far, seven jurors have been selected to participate in the trial. The case involves an alleged payment made to hide an alleged sexual encounter with adult film star Stormy Daniels in the run-up to the 2016 election. Now, Mr. Trump denies the relationship and any wrongdoing. NBC News national correspondent Yasmin Vesugin is outside the courthouse for us this morning. Yasmin, good morning. So as I just said a second ago, yesterday was an off day for the trial, but we did still hear from Mr. Trump. He had some things to say about the jury selection process on social media. Tell us what his objection was here. It was about the striking process. So essentially, when you go through jury selection, which we talked about um, just the other day, 
You go through this process of potential jurors reading off the 42 questions that they answered as they were awaiting to get called into the jury room. And then they go through a strike process, both the defense and the prosecution. And there are peremptory strikes, which essentially means you can literally just strike for whatever reason. And there's causal strikes, right? You have to bring in the evidence as to why you believe this jury will not be appropriate to serve in this trial. And then essentially Judge Juan Mershon has the final say in that. The former president on Twitter um, yesterday essentially said, well, I thought I got unlimited strikes, and it turns out we only get 10 each, which he's right about, by the way. So each side, as I mentioned, only getting 10 each. They can get as many strikes as they want when it comes to those causal strikes. Um, the issue is the final say, as I said already, comes down to Judge Juan Mershon. And I will say, as we saw on Tuesday, and I think we're going to see this again, um, the judge wants to move this thing ahead, right? He wants to get this jury sacked and seated and ready to go. I mean, we're looking at opening arguments beginning possibly on Monday. I think essentially when we first started, we thought this process was going to take possibly two weeks. But mm -hmm. now we're looking at opening arguments starting on Monday with the speed in which this whole thing is moving. Yes, when a court filing yesterday revealed what prosecutors would plan to ask Mr. Trump if he did decide to testify in this trial, which is a big question here. What are we learning here and what do we think the chances are? We'll see that. So essentially what they're establishing and what they want to establish, and, this, and it's, they did this for this thing called the Sandoval hearing. So what that means is the prosecution presents the evidence that they would show if, in fact, Donald J. Trump, the former president of the United States, took the stand. Right. So they do this so that the former president, along with his defense team, can make an educated um, decision about whether or not he wants to testify. Right. And it looks as if it's just three pages, this filing in preparation for the Sandoval hearing. Um, they talk about an establishment of pattern. They talk about the conviction with the E. Jean Carroll case being held liable for sexual assault. They talk about the conviction when it comes to the Trump Corporation, when it tr comes to the Trump Payroll Corporation as well. Um, the violation of the gag order in the Judge Angoron case uh, with the Trump civil fraud trial. So they are establishing a pattern here with that filing, some of which they will bring to the trial if, in fact, the former president, um, Savannah, takes a stand. All right, Yasmin, thank you so much. Well, this morning, more than 20 million people from Texas to Indiana are facing the threat of dangerous storms. Parts of the Midwest are already reeling from heavy rain, wind, and the nearly two dozen tornadoes that tore through communities on Tuesday. In Ohio, thousands of people were left without power after those storms brought down trees, power lines, peeled off roofs of homes, and even flipped over cars. Our storm coverage this morning is going to bring us Angie Lassman with the latest system, placing more than 20 million people stretching from Texas to Indiana at risk for impact. She's going to give us the latest. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. We've already seen quite an active morning across the midsection of our country with severe thunderstorm watches that were issued earlier but have since expired. But it's no surprise we saw that earlier. We had some strong lines of, of thunderstorms working across portions of Kansas and Missouri, but a whole lot of rain, uh, even north of that, up into parts of Iowa, Nebraska. We've even got a little bit of snow falling in that region. And this is going to continue to work its way east. But yes, we are concerned once again with some of those stronger storms potentially severe severe storms packing a punch with all of the hazards on the table right now. We've got 26 million people at risk through the day today. This is this risk will likely last through the evening hours after sunset as well. The bullseye for the best chance of some of those stronger storms, St. Louis, Paducah. But notice from Indianapolis all the way down into Texas, we've got Dallas and Waco included in that. Uh, we could see some of these stronger storms. Again, the hail, the wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour, all possible, along with a couple of tornadoes through today. Meanwhile, as we look at to tomorrow, the severe risk will diminish. It won't be zero, but we're not so much going to look at that to be the most impactful thing for our end of our work week and into our weekend. Instead, we start to see a new storm system developing right along this kind of stationary front that's hanging out in the southern tier of the country. That is the spot that we're going to see the greatest potential for some heavy rain as we go through the next three days, Friday through Saturday, potentially Sunday, and even into Monday in some spots. But that rain is going to be from Texas all the way into the Carolinas as we get through your Sunday. You can see the systems finally on the move, but still dealing with that heavy rain. We're going to eventually see it move off, co off the coast, but we'll continue to see some of that rain left uh, and packing a punch for us for our weekend plans. The flooding concern will be there, specifically places like Dallas, San Angelo, San Antonio, Waco. You're going to see the greatest chance of, of that flash flooding concern, uh, but all the way from Texas up into the Carolinas, again, where we'll see the prolonged periods of some heavy rain over multiple days, we'll have that potential for some flooding. Here's the totals that we're looking at.
that. Again, same spot with the flash flooding risk elevated. That's going to be Dallas. Places like that could see one, one and a half inches, maybe some isolated spots up to two inches. But from the Carolinas to Texas, we've got widespread areas that we'll see over a half an inch up to an inch. So something to note, uh, specifically Saturday to Monday. Now, let's go through the weekend because, of course, it's the most important time of the week. And we've got Friday for most of the country. Actually looks pretty sunny. I mentioned some of those showers that we'll see across parts of the east. It'll be quite warm across Florida, but otherwise lots of sunshine and some mild conditions for the middle of the country out west. We've got 70s on tap for Southern California and plenty of sunshine. We stick with that forecast for our folks there for Saturday, but there's that heavy rain that I mentioned across the southern tier of the country for your Saturday plans. It will unfortunately cool down also for our friends across the Midwest. You're going to see temperatures back to the 40s, back to the 50s after dealing with 60s, 70s, some spots across parts of the east were into the 80s, close to the 90s over the past week or so. We're going to see different story uh, start to settle in here for Saturday. It'll be a little bit milder by Sunday, but those stormy conditions will stick with us across the south all the way through our weekend plans. When you were right, I needed an umbrella and I didn't have it. Did you have a hood at least? No. Yeah, no. Andrew, thank you so much. And I forgot to text you today. You did. Much, and it was rainy this morning. Much more to come here on Morning News Now later this hour. It could be the key to a better night's sleep for millions of people. More on the weight loss drug that could soon be used to treat sleep apnea. At first, though, after the break, closer to closure, the Department of Justice finalizing a landmark settlement for the Olympic gymnasts sexually abused by their doctor. We'll be right back. The FBI failed to interview pertinent parties in a timely manner. It took over 14 months for the FBI to contact me, despite my many requests to be interviewed by them. To be clear, I blame Larry Nassar, and I also blame an entire system that enabled and perpetrated his abuse. That was Olympic gold medalist Allie Raisman and Simone Biles testifying before Congress over the failure by the FBI to properly handle and investigate allegations of sexual abuse made by gymnasts against former National Gymnastics team Dr. Larry Nassar. In a development first reported by the Wall Street Journal, two people familiar with the negotiations told NBC News that the DOJ is nearing a monetary settlement with the victims in the case, and the number is likely to be close to $100 million. A spokesperson from the Justice Department said they can't confirm the Wall Street Journal's report at this time. An investigation by the DOJ found that the FBI failed to act when concerns were raised by athletes. Here with the details on this is NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney. And Ken, good morning. So, Ken, if everyone signs off on this agreement, this brings the total settlements for Nasser's actions between the DOJ and USA Gymnastics and Michigan State University, where he worked, to nearly a billion dollars. Again, this has not been confirmed yet, but explain how this one is different and how the FBI failed to do their job in this case. When we hear things straight from gymnasts, straight from victims of Larry Nasser explaining how they weren't even interviewed, they tried to get in touch. I mean, walk us through exactly what went wrong here that's led to a settlement. Yes, good morning, Savannah. It's really extraordinary. After uh, mustering up the courage to finally report these allegations, which were covered up for years, this conduct, and going to the FBI, these women were not heard. And as you said, in 2021, the Department of Justice Inspector General issued a scathing report documenting the FBI's failures in this case. As one of those gymnasts just said, it was 14 months from the time the FBI first heard about sexual abuse allegations against Larry Nassar to the time they first interviewed a single gymnast. And during that time, it's believed that Larry Nassar may have abused as many as 70 women. And the details of what happened here uh, are really outrageous. There, there were two uh, FBI agents in the Indianapolis field office who first were alerted to these complaints and did nothing with them for a very long time, did not alert the FBI agents in Michigan who really needed to follow up because that's where the conduct was occurring. And one of those FBI agents was actually negotiating for a job with the U.S. Olympic Committee at the time. One of them was fired, uh, another resigned, uh, but uh, that doesn't do anything to ease the pain, obviously, of these women. Uh, and now they're approaching uh, settlement negotiations and re getting ready to pay a really large sum of money. And by the way, it's hard to sue the federal government. So this $100 million is a really big deal. 
the Justice Department, you mentioned, you know, somebody fired, somebody resigning, but it's one thing to pay or to see something like that happen. Has the Justice Department actually addressed its failure in their duty to these gymnasts for not properly handling their complaints? Have they, have they addressed it, admitted it, and, and tried to rectify it in any way other than this payment? To a certain extent, yes. And when we say the Justice Department, we're really talking about the FBI. And FBI Director Christopher Wray actually was in, the, in Indianapolis last year, and he addressed this. He got questions from local reporters. He said every great organization makes mistakes. Uh, the, the key is to learn from the, those mistakes, and we have learned from them. The thing is, the FBI is not a very transparent organization, so we don't know exactly what steps they've taken to make sure that this kind of thing internally can never happen again. You know, and sometimes it, it's chucked up to just bad conduct and incompetence by a handful of employees. Uh, but look, this is the third major settlement that the Justice Department has had to pay out because of FBI failures. The last two were involved uh, mass shootings. But this is a lot of money that taxpayers are having to pay because FBI agents didn't do their jobs. So is there any transparency here about how something like this can be prevented from happening in the future? Well, not really. That's the issue. It's the FBI just doesn't like to let the public see exactly what they're doing. Um, and, you know, it's a huge organization. They, they do say that they have taken steps internally to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Exactly what those steps are, uh, they need to be pressed on because they really haven't been transparent about it, Savannah. All right, Kendall Anian, thank you so much. Well, time now for some international headlines, starting with a new development in what is being called the largest gold heist in Canada's history. Megan Fitzgerald joins us now with that and more. Hey, Megan, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. That's right, we start in Canada with what's being called the biggest gold theft uh, in the country's history. Now, police say more than $14 million worth of gold bars were stolen a year ago, along with millions of dollars worth of cash from Toronto's Pearson Airport. Investigators say they arrested the alleged driver in the U.S. and recovered dozens of guns they believe were meant to be used in Canada. And in Indonesia, hundreds of people have been forced to evacuate after a volcano on a remote island erupted multiple times. Now there's fears the volcano could partially collapse and trigger a tsunami. Indonesia has more than 120 active volcanoes and sits along the Ring of Fire, which is an arc of seismic fault lines in the Pacific Ocean. And two new major marine parks will be created in Greece by the end of this year, according to the country's energy minister. One of the parks will focus on protecting seabirds in the Aegean Sea. The other park will focus on protecting marine mammals Animals. The announcement is controversial, though. Turkey is accusing Greece of exploiting environmental issues to push a geopolitical agenda and has called on the country to abandon its plans. Savannah. All right, Megan, thank you so much. Well, coming up, understaffed and overworked, police departments across the country sounding the alarm as response times grow. What they say is behind the problem and what one city is doing about it. Plus, the emotional toll of higher education. More and more college students say they're stressed out about school, how one group is working to protect their mental health. This is Morning News Now. We are back with a closer look at a growing problem among police departments across the country. Staffing shortages. The Los Angeles police say they're severely understaffed and it's impacting response times for non-emergency calls. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt sat down with the LAPD's chief to see what they're doing about it. Here in Los Angeles, police and residents are feeling the strain from a chronic shortage of police officers. L.A., one of many cities, losing officers practically faster than they can hire new ones. I spoke with the LAPD's interim chief about how he's addressing the crisis. The LAPD has long been considered one of the most understaffed major city police departments in America making the current staffing crisis all the more troubling for the top brass. Chief, is it fair to say you are severely understaffed? Absolutely. Recruitment, now a critical issue for interim police chief Dominic Choi. Among the three largest cities, Chicago and New York have about twice as many cops per capita, while Los Angeles is far more vast. I think if we had about 12,000, we would be... Um, 
well-staffed, and as of last Monday, we are at 8,832. That's the lowest staffing level at the LAPD in more than two decades, and it's having a direct impact on the department's ability to police. Has the shortage of police officers simply made it harder to respond to, to certain types of calls? I think it's made it more difficult to respond to all types of calls. Where we're seeing some slippage is our non-emergency calls. We've seen that number go from an average response time of about 20 minutes upwards to uh, 40 minutes up to an hour. Calls like this one, where a group of mass suspects use power tools to cut through the security door and safe at the Siete Mares restaurant in Boyle Heights, with the suspects taking off. Everybody was on edge. With no arrests made, Tanya Diaz and her family, who've owned this restaurant for decades, say the neighborhood feels less safe. There's not as many cops out in the streets there anymore, so we got hit. And then a couple weeks later, another restaurant got hit. While violent crime trended down in 2023, property crimes were up. A revolving door of repeat offenders taking a toll on morale. I understand the frustration uh, that an officer works so hard to put somebody in jail because of criminal behavior, and then that person is walking out the door before they can finish their reports. That is frustra frustrating, it's demoralizing. Law enforcement agencies nationwide are feeling the crunch with unprecedented declines in police staffing since 2019. In a recent report, the Department of Justice calling it a historic crisis, saying departments are losing officers faster than they can hire new ones, citing labor market competition, officer safety and well-being, and increased tensions between police and the communities they serve. It affects the ability of the agency to even respond to relatively low-level um, concerns, but that are high quality of life concerns for the communities. To entice new recruits, the LAPD recently negotiated pay increases. New full-time officers can now make nearly six figures, about the same starting salary for a computer engineer graduating from the University of California system. Not everybody thinks a lot, a lot of police officers are a good thing. There, there are those voices out there um, that say this money could be used in a more efficient way. What's your response to that? I'm an absolute supporter of alternative response. So there are certain calls that I believe that police don't need to respond to. To the people that think less cops are okay, um, I, I have to disagree. At the end of the day, you have to have a safe community. Our thanks to Lester Holt for that report. Well, more colleges are now rethinking their approach to the growing demand for mental health services on campus. According to a recent survey, 69% of four-year college students are suffering from emotional stress. Well, now a new report from the Jed Foundation, that is a nonprofit working to prevent suicide in teens, is highlighting how a different approach could benefit those students. We have two guests with us here to take a closer look at this report. We've got Jed Foundation CEO and my friend John McPhee alongside SUNY at Westchester Community. Community College student Lotus Taylor. Good morning to both of you. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you coming in and I'm so excited to talk about this report because it's so important. Um, John, I'm going to start with you. So I know a lot about the Jed Foundation's work, but specifically even these numbers blew me away because essentially what's happening here is you have this Jed campus program and what you're seeing, what this report is, right, is numbers out of that, what you've actually seen over time about what this program does. I want to read some of the numbers. 25% less likely that a student reports a suicide attempt. 13% less likely on suicide planning, 10% on suicide ideation. What is this program? How are you doing this and making this impact? Yeah, so the JED Campus Program is a program in which the JED Foundation, and as you noted, we're a nonprofit that focuses on teen and young adult mental health, partners with a college for four years. And we partner with them to help them survey their students and understand their students' needs, and then to uh, assess their programs, policies, and systems, their culture around supporting student mental health and reducing risk for suicide. And we partner and advise them over the period of four years to help them implement recommended and best practices for supporting their students. And 440 colleges across the country uh, participate in this program. 
And tell me what some of those recommendations are, like what types of things are actually happening on campuses? Yeah, so these are recommendations to take actions to help students develop life skills, problem solving and coping skills because we know those are protective for mental health, mm. to create a culture where students know it's okay not to be okay and where and how to get help, and then to really map out the system so that when a student needs mental health care, they're getting the mental health care they need, whether it's at the school or out in the community. Mm. So, Lotus, the campus that you're on, right, is one that has this program implemented. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what it's like, what you actually see, feel, have access to on your campus because of this program? Yeah, so Judd came to our campus in 2019 um, and we're able to offer a vast number of improvements. We were able to increase the amount of clinicians we have on campus. We started with two, now we have four, um, and we also have a private mental health suite um, in on campus in our mental health uh, in our health office on our campus. Um, we also have two different clubs and organizations that are dedicated to mental health. Um, and we consistently have trainings, events that are surrounded with mental health, taking care of yourself. Sometimes we have therapy dogs come on campus, mm. which is so fun. Um, it's a very mental health positive campus. And I think it's definitely thanks to a lot of what Jed has done. Not only on your campus, but if we broaden it out to your generation, do you think that the stigma around talking about something like this, around asking for help, around offering help, is loosening? Do you think that your generation is more comfortable with addressing this head on? I think so. I mean, obviously culture plays into it as far as personal and familial culture, but people in my age group and my generation are genuinely more open to talking about mental health, seeking treatment, encouraging others to do so as well. And John, tell us in this report, so walk us through exactly, I know it's, like I said, quite a few years now of actually seeing this work in action. Tell us how you were able to siphon out this information and then maybe also what really surprised or excited you about what you were able to see in data about what this program's doing. Yeah, so the data analyzed is uh, analyzing a data set from 73 colleges that finished the program with over 100,000 students full of, of data. Um, and students are surveyed at the beginning of the work with a college and then again at the end. And we're also collecting data on all the policy programs and systems the school has and the changes they're making, things like Lotus described. Mm -hmm. And so the, the analysis shows, as you noted, reductions of 10% in suicidal ideation reports from students, 13% uh, in suicide planning, 25% in uh, suicide attempts, and also improvements in average depression and anxiety scores and improvements in retention and graduation rates. Mm -hmm. I would say that none of this really surprised us at Jed, but it was very gratifying to see that when a school like SUNY Westchester takes purposeful and comprehensive actions, they see these kinds of results. How I can add, please. Um, we had a 50% increase in usage of services mm, from wow. 2019 um, in the 2020 2021 year till now. Um, it is very well used, consistently um, supported, and it's been really great. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, what's it like for you to hear that, to just know how much there, um, an uptick it's, there is in students even seeking it out? It's amazing, mm -hmm. it's amazing. It's an amazing testament to Lotus's generation, as you noted, and to the work that schools like SUNY Westchester are doing. Absolutely, I think also for people who are at home, like we talk about mental health a lot, we certainly do on this show, and we appreciate our viewers for engaging in that conversation most days. But when, it, when you talk about actual suicide ideation, reports of attempts, it's kind of, I think, maybe even for parents startling to be like, okay, there's a difference in having a conversation about mental health and if my child's okay, and then something like that. How important is work specifically aimed at changing the conversation around suicide and lowering those numbers? It's very important, yeah. Unfortunately, suicide is the second leading cause of death of young people, and so it's something that we need to talk about and to put plans in place, and it's important for us just as friends and family members to talk to each other about it. If we're worried about a friend, worried about a family member, to ask how they're doing, are they okay? Um, and it is okay to ask somebody if they're thinking about harming themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, just how impactful has it been to have these resources and to have that open line of communication on something as serious as this? It's been 
been amazing. Um, we use it even, I'm student government president, we use it in our clubs and organizations as well. So our mental health services works with a program Jed introduced called Brave Talk. Um, it helps train student leaders in mm -hmm. how to have a conversation with someone who is potentially struggling, potentially having thoughts of suicidal ideation, and how to effectively help them seek help, um, professional help. We also have like strategic referrals through our mental health and counseling department. Um, it's it's been honestly really great, especially with the growing conversation around mental health and feeling supported as students. We feel supported. Absolutely. Lotus and John, thank you both so much for coming by. Great to see you. Incredible work that you're doing, and it's so great that we're able to quantify it with this report. So thank you so much for sharing it. This report's just out today. We appreciate you both coming on. So nice to have you both here. And if you or anyone you know is struggling, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. It's on your screen right now, just 988, just those three numbers. Well, coming up, a popular weight loss drug showing new promise in another area. When we come back, what scientists are saying about the drug's additional benefits that could help millions of people get a better night's sleep. Plus, problem in the produce aisle, a new report that's renewing concern about the amount of pesticides in your fruits and veggies. You're watching Morning News Now. We're back now with some important health news that could impact the millions of Americans who suffer from sleep apnea. New trials from drug maker Eli Lilly show its weight loss drug, ZetBound, help reduce irregular breathing episodes by as much as 63%. And those results are adding to some pretty eye-opening evidence showing other weight loss and diabetes drugs on the market that could have additional health benefits. For more on this, let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. Dr. Patel, always great to have you with us. So walk us through this. How is it that ZetBound, and, and put in context also for people who are like, so is that kind of like Ozempic? Is that kind of like Manjaro? How does it right. work? And how does Eli Lilly say it helps when it comes to sleep? apnea. Yeah, Savannah. So a couple of things. This hasn't been peer reviewed and hasn't been published. This is kind of an announcement by press release, but they are going to re release more detailed findings in June. But what we know so far, Zepbound, you're right, to kind of make sure that we know what we're talking about. It's really the same chemical, terzepatide, as Manjaro. Zepbound is the name that's approved by the FDA, manufactured by Eli Lilly, approved for weight loss. So this is a drug you can get today with the indication from a doctor for weight loss. So just to put that into context. So Manjaro is kind of the other drug that you can compare it to, the same chemical. And it acts by really quieting down your brain and other parts of your body from getting hungry. It really suppresses kind of the appetite drive that we have that we now know is really in your gut and it's also mental and it improves your insulin response, meaning the insulin that your pancreas normally makes to help you respond to sugar when you eat it, it helps improve the sensitivity and the effectiveness of that insulin. All in all, we're learning more and more about how much more this drug does beyond weight loss, like we're finding out with sleep apnea. Yeah, so could this be a replacement for sleep apnea machines sleep just apnea. when it comes to this particular yeah. issue? Yeah, it's a really great question. So you mentioned that there was already this finding in the study. These were patients that had moderate to severe sleep apnea. Not all of them were take on CPAP or those machines that they use for sleep apnea. So some were not and some were, but in both sets of patients, they saw that reduction in the times that you stop breathing, which is kind of a classic hallmark. We always knew, Savannah, that obstructive sleep apnea was associated with obesity, and we knew that weight loss probably could help with sleep apnea, but we had to resort to pretty extreme measures like bariatric surgery or some other interventions. Now we have a possibility. So it is possible, once we see more data, that you could see this drug becoming the first thing that we reach for with patients that have a diagnosis of sleep apnea, which we think estimate affects about 20 to 30 million Americans in the United States. So you just made a really good point, Dr. Patel, which is that sleep apnea had long been linked to obesity. So I guess that my question right. is, could using a drug like this, if it's making you lose weight, then essentially mean, oh, right. hey, this is a benefit, you know, just like just like mobility is a benefit right. of losing weight. Or could somebody who does not need to lose weight get prescribed this just because they have sleep apnea? Right. That's exactly. So that, I think, is what we would love to see. Some of the reason I mentioned up top that there is not as much of the detail. That is exactly the question that I've been asking, that we know that obesity has a factor. But what if we have people with a diagnosis of sleep apnea and they don't meet that criteria for obesity? 
they might be overweight or they might have normal body weight by kind of our current standards. I think this opens up a really important question and some of the things that I'll be looking for when they release the detailed results in June. But bottom line, Savannah, every day we're learning a little bit more about this drug. Remember, there's no silver bullet. There are some side effects. People did report some of those GI side effects. And I think it's important to know that there are going to probably be multiple approaches depending on who you are with sleep apnea and how your body responds to drugs or to even a sleep apnea machine. Doctor, I guess my next question is like, how are you just feeling about these drugs in general? For all of us, I mean, yeah. to me, it feels like they kind of came out of nowhere. Everybody's talking about them. It feels like a lot of people are using them for a lot of different reasons. But it's also like, do we know that much about them? Do we know what a long-term effect is? We start to hear about other impacts on our society, like, like people purchasing yeah. food and all these other different types of things. I mean, how do you feel about long-term where we're headed with these types of drugs that sort of feel new and novel, but do seem to keep on every day there's a new reason to prescribe them? Yeah, I, I see this a lot. Look, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've kind of been practicing medicine for a while, and I make this analogy to when statins came out, that class of drugs that we use for high cholesterol. 10, dec you know, 10, 20 years ago, even when I was starting to train, everybody used statins and we didn't know what the long-term effects are. And now we really know. I think these drugs are in a similar class that we're seeing so many positive effects. Bottom line, Savannah, these drugs have changed the landscape of American medicine, global medicine, and will likely have a significant effect on generations. Mm -hmm. But we are unpacking more and more of what we know about them. First things first, we need to get them accessible and get costs more accessible to people and a supply chain Absolutely. that can provide them. All right, Dr. Patel, fascinating conversation as always on these ones. Yeah, Thanks for joining thanks. us. Well, if you hit, plan to hit the grocery store this week, you might want to listen to this. A new review by Consumer Reports examined which fruits and vegetables contain high levels of pesticides. 20% of the foods tested in the report posed a serious pesticide risk, including popular items like bell peppers, blueberries, and strawberries. Let's bring in Catherine Roberts for more on this report. She's a health reporter for Consumer Reports. Catherine, good morning. So let's start with the basics here. Which fruits and vegetables have the highest risk for pesticides and then how bad is that for us how much of a concern is it so right so in our analysis some of the higher risk items were things like blueberries bell peppers um, also hot peppers kale mustard greens um, potatoes um, and watermelons now it's important to know you don't need to totally cut these out of your diet um, but our advice is really to limit them and that's especially for people who are pregnant or young children, um, it's going to be most important um, for those kinds of people. Um, you know, pesticides have been linked to a, a lot of different health effects like cancer and cardiovascular disease. Um, many of them are also suspected endocrine disruptors, which means that they interfere with the body's hormones. Um, and again, that kind of thing is most important um, in those sensitive stages of development like early childhood and pregnancy. So you don't need to totally stop eating these, uh, but it is a good idea to maybe limit them or substitute out some things sometimes. So is the answer here buying organic? Um, that is one answer, you know, in our analysis um, for the for the data that we had, um, uh, didn't have data on every organic version, but usually the organic versions um, are a lot less risky when it comes to pesticides. But there can be expensive too. So you yeah. uh, also substitute for other, you know, less risky conventional versions. Um, you can buy organic when you can on just a few things, those kinds of things. So talk to us about less risky, which remind us what that list is. Um, lots of things. Uh, the, the good news in this report is there are a lot of items that are very low risk. Um, I'll just run through a few, you know, uh, let's see, onions, low risk, squash, sweet potatoes, um, cucumbers, cauliflower, tons of things are low risk. That's the great news. Um, so <laughs> uh, it's, 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 you have a lot of really good options. That is really good news. So for people who are like, well, even if I like those ones that are high risk, if I just run it under some water, maybe even if I kind of give it a good scrub, does that help here? Is, is washing produce helpful or not, not the idea? So it is helpful. Um, the, the, we use data from the USDA to do this analysis, and they actually do that um, before they test. So actually washing produce, cold water for um, you know, 15 to 20 seconds, scrubbing if, if, it, if it's not a, a delicate kind of skin, um, that is a good idea, um, but that won't get you, um, <laughs> that won't improve basically on what the USDA found. Um, so it is a, a really important step to get some pesticides off the surface, but it's not totally going to solve the problem. Catherine Roberts, thank you so much. Good advice for people as they head to the grocery store. We appreciate it.
Let's get to some financial headlines now. Google has fired dozens of employees who protested a billion-dollar contract with Israel. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that. Another news, Silvana. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. Yes, so as you mentioned, Google it terminated 28 employees Wednesday following a series of protests in multiple cities. Now, that's according to an internal memo viewed by CNBC. The company's vice president of global security wrote that they will continue to investigate and take action as needed. The workers were speaking out against labor conditions and the company's contract to provide Israel with cloud computing and AI services. The news comes shortly after nine employees were arrested on trespassing charges after staging sit-ins at two of the company's offices. Meanwhile, Tesla is making more cuts. The automaker announced they will be laying off 285 employees in Buffalo, New York. This is part of a broader restructuring plan. Now, that's according to a war notice filed in the state. The layoffs account for around 14% of Buffalo's workforce. Most of the employees work for Tesla's factory, which produces supercharger equipment. The move follows a company-wide memo sent earlier this week saying that the automaker would be reducing more than 10% of its global workforce. And as Tesla navigates these cuts, CEO Elon Musk sent an email saying the company sent incorrectly low severance packages to some laid off employees. In the memo email seen by CNBC, Musk apologized and said the mistake would be corrected immediately. Few details have been released about Tesla's shakeup, but Musk sent out a company-wide memo Monday assuring that the layoffs would help prepare the company for the next phase of growth, Savannah. Mm. All right, Savannah, now thank you so much. Yeah. Coming up, a retro revival fitting for this throwback Thursday. When we come back, I'll show you how old school split flap displays are getting a new life. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. We've got a baby on tour alert. Ashanti has confirmed that not only is she expecting, she's engaged. This is the singer's first child with her now fiance, Nelly. The couple confirmed they had rekindled their romance back in September of last year. That's a decade after calling it quits the first time. They actually teased a possible pregnancy announcement back in December after Nelly's 11th annual black and white ball. But with this confirmation, we can send a big congratulations to the talented hip hop duo, I guess they're becoming a trio now. Very cool. Great to see. And so cool that she's on tour while saying it. Well, finally this hour, we're introducing you to a Philly-based company that's putting a literal spin on the idea of taking something old and making it new again by defying a digital world and going analog. NBC News correspondent George Solis has this story. You could call them a timeless classic with a lot to say. Simple, elegant, and just plain cool. For decades, split flap boards have been turning heads at airports and train halls, conveying info for travelers to a treat for the eyes and ears. And while most displays have gone digital, like the beloved display at Philadelphia's 30th Street Station, just a quick drive nearby, Oat Foundry is not only hand building them, they're bringing retro back. All right, welcome to Oat Foundry. Let's do a little tour. All right, I'm excited, which I quickly learned is no picnic. That's the correct way to do it incorrectly. Yeah. The correct way to do it incorrectly. Yeah, so the company successfully turning the clock back on Split Flap. So far, installing more than 300 boards in offices, bars, and restaurants in 30 states and in 23 countries and counting. Google, Carnival Cruises, and Starbucks among some of the big names going analog. In New York City, more than 650,000 daily travelers are greeted by the flutter of flaps relaying transit data at the Irish Exit Bar in Moynihan Train Hall. And so why split flap? There's something nostalgic about it. It's a timeless design. And so we started making them and really just falling in love with it. It's definitely a romantic product to build. Mark Kuhn is CEO and one of the co-founders of the now multi-million dollar company started in 2013 with a mission to build cool stuff. Challenged by their restaurant client Honeygrow to create a new way to call orders, the team realized they could flip the script on digital advertising. You bank on split flaps, and it's paid off in pretty big dividends, it sounds like. We knew that there was something special about this, and then we're able to grow not just business operations, but our team here with the necessary roles for that. Behind every click, 50 characters per carousel moving in tandem create every clack. There's definitely a, a ballet that happens. I mean, you, you're talking about tens of thousands of moving pieces. 
Fast Company writer Nate Berg, covering design, agrees Oak Foundry's mix of innovation and tradition is part of a spiked interest in the antique. We've seen this push towards novelty items like typewriters, vinyl, and now split flap. Is there a growing market for more analog? I think there is. I mean, it's going to be a niche, but this kind of sign I think is going to be really useful in a, a cafe setting, a restaurant, a bar. It's mostly just to differentiate themselves, like to have something that customers maybe don't expect or don't get to see wherever they go. The team moving beyond letters, numbers, and characters with full color images. Picture flap came out of split flap. Each design made to order for however big or small the client is willing to pay. They're built to last. We have a sign in our shop that's been running for 39 million rotations, which for the average user is like 300 years of use. So there's longevity here. Yeah, you're buying quality. Longevity, Oat Foundry appreciates for those who are willing to stop and listen. Do you think we're in an era or revisiting a time where we're going to see more analog technology come back? I hope so. I think that there's a future where the technology that we see, the analog technology we see, can have all that, that magic, but it doesn't have to just be a black obelisk glass screen in your pocket. It doesn't have to just be the digital glow of screens in an airport or train station. It can be this warmer sort of handshake between where we are now and where we're going. Our thanks to George Solis for that story. So if you're like me and you're thinking, hey, that'd be kind of cool to have in my house. Well, just so you know, displays start at around 50 grand. The team is hopeful they can bring them down. They can be the ones to bring back a functioning, excuse me, board to Philly's 30th Street Station. The original was removed because finding parts became increasingly difficult, but it's a challenge that can hopefully withstand the test of time. Pretty cool to see. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but stay with us. The news continues right now. morning. Happy Thursday. Almost through the week. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe's off today right now on Morning News Now. We are tracking some wild weather that's whipping across the country. This morning, millions in the Midwest are waking up to more heavy rain and threats of dangerous flash flooding as officials there reel from several reported tornadoes that swept through the region. Our Angie Lastman has the storm's latest track. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, anti-Semitism on college campuses back in the spotlight. How Columbia's president is responding to students who say they no longer feel safe on school grounds and her message to lawmakers. In royal news, Prince William is officially heading back to work, returning to his public duties today for the first time since Princess Kate revealed her cancer diagnosis. We've got more on that in just a moment. And to all my fellow Swifties, are you ready for it? A brand new era for the one and only Taylor Swift is about to drop at midnight tonight. In typical Taylor fashion, there's already no shortage of Easter eggs out there for eagle-eyed fans. We'll bring you everything we know about her latest album, The Tortured Poets Department, a little later in the hour. I cannot wait. Good morning. Thanks again for joining us. We're going to get started with another round of dangerous storms in the Midwest. Tornado watches were in effect overnight in Pennsylvania after dangerous conditions swept through multiple states, including Ohio, Missouri, and Michigan with Iowa's governor issuing a disaster declaration after tornadoes there earlier this week. Maggie Vespa joins us from hard hit Ferndale, Michigan. Maggie, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, officials here in Ferndale called yesterday's storm, quote, quick, but unbelievably wild. Wind speeds here topping 70 miles per hour. Look at that ripping part of the roof off of this restaurant and this tire shop. And then look at this, tossing huge pieces of it onto the cars here in the parking lot below. And as you point out, this is just the latest chapter in this week of widespread severe weather. This morning, the trail of damage from severe spring weather is growing after another line of violent storms packing strong winds and reported tornadoes ripped through multiple states across the Midwest, uprooting trees, flipping cars, and leveling homes. We were trying this store in Ohio hit hard after winds Wednesday night ripped off a chunk of its roof. I want to get down. This video taken from inside a post office gives a first-hand uh, glimpse at the strength of the dangerous gusts. Lost part of our tree. Crews are now working around the clock as homes are in desperate need of repair and power lines are impacted with more than two dozen tornadoes reported in at least five states since Monday. That's a tornado. The twisters ripping across the Midwest, leaving stunning scenes of destruction. It's blown up. I mean, it's 
no other way to say it. It's blown up. Iowa's governor declaring a disaster in six counties. It's heart wrenching. Neighbors there helping an 85 year old woman whose home was completely destroyed as students from nearby schools pitch in to sort through the rubble. It's just amazing how many people will come out of the woodworks to help. And we're so glad there are so many people there to help. Somewhat miraculously, by the way, we haven't had any reports of any serious injuries from all of these storms this week. But get this, so far this year, we've had more than 300 tornadoes reported across 26 states. And May next month is historically the busiest for tornadoes nationwide. Mm, wow. Savannah. All right, Maggie, thank you so much. Well, we're going to continue and take a look at the severe weather with meteorologist Angie Lastman. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. And that severe threat that Maggie was just talking about continues today. We've got a, another system that we are tracking across that same kind of similar region of the country to leave us with the potential for some strong storms. We've already seen some watches mornings up this morning. Those have all since expired across parts of the plains, but still plenty of rain and a strong line of thunderstorms working across parts of Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, stretching farther north into places like Wisconsin and um, and Minnesota, we've got the rain. Here's the area that we're going to closely watch for the potential for some strong storms later today. We've got 26 million people in the risk area, damaging wind, strong wind, or damaging hail, rather, strong wind gusts, as well as just a couple of tornadoes possible here as we get even through the evening hours, places like St. Louis, Springfield, Little Rock, Dallas, all included in that risk area as we had it through the day today. As we turn our attention to Friday, rounding out our work week, Here's what we're watching. This next storm system is going to develop, and it's going to be a rainmaker. That's what we're watching as far as the impacts from this system. So the severe weather threat will diminish slightly, but that will ramp up the potential for some flooding concerns across the southern tier of the country, really, as we get into our weekend and beyond. By Saturday, this rain is going to span from Texas all the way up into the Carolinas. It'll be soggy. We'll have periods of really heavy rain, especially across places like Texas, over the next couple of days. And finally, as we get into Sunday, rounding out our weekend, we'll see the system start to exit. Rain still in the picture for parts of the southeast and up through the, the mid-Atlantic here as we get through your Sunday. And for that, we're going to, of course, we're going to be watching for the flooding concerns. We've got a flash flood slight risk centered across portions of Dallas, San Angelo, San Antonio, Houston, places like Jackson, Atlanta, and up into Raleigh. All those locations, a marginal risk, but either way, it's not hard for us to see some flooding in this region. So we'll likely be watching for at least some isolated areas of some localized flooding, but the flash flooding potential potential will be there too. Specifically where you see the yellows, the oranges, the reds, those are the accumulations that we're expecting to be upwards of about an inch. So one to two inches is the more likely amount. We could see some isolated amounts up to three inches. So we'll be watching for the flooding concern in that area. Temperature wise, we're a tale of two areas when it comes to uh, seasons for parts of the upper Midwest. We've got temperatures in the 50s and the 40s. We're running 20 degrees below normal for Denver by this afternoon with a high of just 43 degrees. A very different story if you look just to the east for places like Nashville and Little Rock, which are going to surge into the mid 80s. We'll see these temperatures stick around for some folks, just a sliver really of the southeast here as we get into tomorrow. And that cooler air will start to spread a little farther to the south and east. East. We've got Chicago on tap to hit just 59 degrees tomorrow. Kansas City into the upper 50s. Cheyenne, whoo, it's upper 30s for you tomorrow. That's as warm as it's going to get. And a big difference oh. when you look at Augusta, which will hit 90 degrees. So oh. feeling like summer there, feeling like winter, honestly, in some spots across parts of the northern plains. We'll see Montgomery head to the upper 80s. Then we'll start to kind of gradually rebound in some of those cooler areas. So Omaha, you go from the low 50s for any Saturday plans you have, but then back to work by Monday, upper 60s it is. So, you know, don't put the coats away yet, but you won't need them by the time you get back to work. St. Louis, similar story, low 60s for both Saturday and Sunday. Monday, you return to the 70s. Nashville will kind of hover around into the 60s and places like Oklahoma City, upper 50s to low 60s Saturday and Sunday and then returning to work into the 70s. Um, it's just a, a slow rebound back to where we typically should be for this time of year as we look across that part of the country. The whiplash. Oh, the my weather gosh. Whiplash. The fake summer. The little <laughs> glimpse of nice yes. weather. Right a back. tease, really. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Angie, thank you so much. Of course. Now let's head to Capitol Hill, where House Speaker Mike Johnson has introduced bills aimed at providing aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. This comes as Johnson is facing strong opposition from fellow House Republicans, potentially putting his speakership in jeopardy. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us from Washington with the latest developments here. Hey, Ryan, good morning. So Speaker Johnson had previously voted against giving aid to Ukraine before he became House Speaker. 
What's different this time around and how could a foreign aid package pass the House with Republicans holding this very slim majority? Yeah, Savannah, it is a remarkable shift in uh, Speaker Johnson's tone as it relates to Ukraine funding. You're absolutely right. He voted against it before he was Speaker of the House. I think the big difference between uh, the rank and file member that he was then and the leader that he is now is that he has access to these classified national security briefings where he has given in stark terms a real understanding of what is happening on the ground in Ukraine uh, and is now convinced that the situation there is dire. He said that he believes these intelligence reports. Uh, and he is concerned that Ukraine could fall uh, and that that could uh, really reduce the stability uh, of Europe and the world beyond. And that's why he has basically drawn a line in the sand and said that he believes Ukraine needs to be funded, that he's going to support it. He's going to put it on the floor. Uh, and that's how this process is playing out here over the next couple of days, Savannah. So, Ryan, ultimately, is Speaker Johnson's job actually in jeopardy? Where do things stand right now with these members of his own party who do not like what he's doing? Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think that was what was so stark uh, about what we saw from him yesterday. Up until yesterday, he'd been trying to have it both ways, was trying to find some way to put Ukraine aid on the floor in a way that it would appease the right wing flank uh, of his party and hopefully per preserve his speakership. He seems to have come to the recognition that he can't have it both ways. And basically what he told us yesterday is if this means that he'll lose his job, he doesn't care. Take a listen. If I operated uh, out of fear over a motion to vacate, I would never be able to do my job. I, look, history judges us for what we do. This is a critical time right now, a critical time on the world stage. I, I could make a, you know, I, I could make a selfish decision and 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 do something that um, th that that's different. But I, I'm doing here what I believe to be the right thing. You know, Savannah, I have to tell you, having been covering this specific aspect, this battle over funding for Ukraine, uh, up until yesterday, I, I really thought there was probably no chance uh, that it had a path to actually being passed. I feel very differently about it now, mm. judging by the way the speaker talked about it yesterday. It seems realistic that they can get it done. There's a lot of work still to be uh, to still happen between now and passage. But this is a very different tone that you're seeing uh, from the Republican leader in the House. And Ryan, on a similar note here during a meeting, yesterday with the Prime Minister of Ukraine, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen dialed up the pressure on House Republicans to act. What was her message? She basically said that if they don't do something now, Ukraine could lose the war. And this is something that we've heard national security experts, uh, cabinet secretaries, uh, the leaders of the intelligence and House Armed Services Committee say over and over again that this isn't something that the Congress can mess around with anymore, that they've tried to find every which way to allow Ukraine to have the resources that it needs to at least hold Russia off. We're now starting to see Russia make gains uh, in places that they had not made gains uh, in several months. They believe that the time is now to get this uh, legislation passed, to get the funding to Ukraine as soon as possible. And if they don't, the consequences could be dire. It's still a lot of work to be done, Savannah. It isn't not over the finish line quite yet, but it at least looks like it's in a universe where it may happen. All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. Well, the president of Columbia University was on Capitol Hill yesterday facing questions from lawmakers about allegations of anti-Semitism on campus. She's the latest college official to testify before the House's Committee on Education and the Workforce about the issue. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig joins us now. Garrett, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. And yeah, Congress has taken a notable interest in how especially elite universities are responding to the rise in anti-Semitism on their campuses, holding hearings with Ivy League university leaders again yesterday as events half a world away fuel campus debate and in some cases, hate. As pro-Palestinian protests spread from coast to coast this week, New York's Columbia University has become the latest flashpoint in the debate over rising anti-Semitism on college campuses and in the peace protest movement. With some Jewish students saying they feel unsafe. We feel targeted as Jews and pro Israel students on campus. There's a lot of anxiety around campus and I think um, a lot of students don't feel protected, both my Jewish peers and uh, my Arab and, and Muslim peers. The Ivy League University's president testifying before Congress Wednesday, even as protests flared on campus. Anti-Semitism has no place on our campus, and I am personally committed to doing everything I can to confront it directly. Administrators pressed to respond to some of the most appalling examples of anti-Semitism. Does calling for the genocide of Jews 
violate Columbia's code of conduct? Mr. Greenwald. Yes, it does. Ms. Shipman. Yes, it does. Dr. Shafiq. Yes, it does. That exchange notable after the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard's presidents stumbled over the same line of questioning last year, ultimately resigning their posts. Calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard code of conduct, correct? Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. Some questioning Wednesday focused on the commentary of certain faculty members. Support of terrorism is acceptable if you're a Columbia professor? Not at all. While some Democrats criticize the Republican-led committee for being more focused on creating viral moments than on protecting Jewish students. This committee has held three hearings on anti-Semitism on college campuses, but not one of these hearings has considered a bill to actually address the scourge of anti-Semitism. Now, the protests at Columbia, which has a long history of political activism, continued late overnight, are expected to resume again today. The House committee, by the way, says they will continue their investigation, expanding it to more college campuses. Savannah. All right, Garrett, thank you so much. Well, now to a growing concern and anger also on Capitol Hill over new whistleblower allegations directed at Boeing. This includes claims about the construction of certain Boeing jets and questions over the company's commitment to safety. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello covers aviation, of course, joins us from Reagan National Airport. Tom, good morning. So these are some pretty strong allegations from insiders who've continued to bring us these exclusive interviews. What can you tell us we're hearing today? Yeah, that's right. So these are whistleblowers. We heard from a former Boeing uh, whistleblower, a former FAA, a former Boeing engineer, I should say, former FAA engineer and inspector, and a present Boeing engineer. He's the one who warned this week about potential fatal flaws with one of the planes. We also heard from a, a, an outside panel reporting back to Congress. They were commissioned to do a report on the culture inside Boeing. All of this as a very divided Congress seems to be united on the issue of Boeing. Every second of the day, a Boeing jet is in the air. But after two fatal MAX 8 crashes overseas five years ago, a MAX 9 door plug blowout in January, and Boeing's admitted quality control breakdowns, whistleblowers told Congress they feel the need to speak out. Effectively, they are putting out defective airplanes. One of them making a stunning claim about the 777 assembly line. I literally saw people jumping on the pieces of the airplane to get them to align. I call it the Tarzan effect. Engineer Sam Salapour told senators what he told us in an exclusive interview this week, that Boeing's 787 fuselage has a manufacturing flaw that could cause it to break apart in flight. Should Boeing ground the 787 right now to check the gap sizes? I would say they need to. The entire fleet worldwide? The entire fleet worldwide. But Boeing says that's simply not true, reiterating that in 13 years of service and after extensive stress testing and checks, we have found zero fatigue and we are fully confident in the safety and durability of the 787 Dreamliner. On Wednesday, releasing this video of extensive testing on the 787's composite material, United Airlines CEO says he too is confident. There are thousands of these airplanes. They've been flying for decades, millions of flight hours. I am totally confident the 787 is a safe airplane. But with family members of some of the 346 MAX 8 victims on Capitol Hill, another former Boeing employee turned whistleblower says the company has dodged accountability. Not a single person from Boeing went to jail. Hundreds of people died and there's been no justice. A divided Congress seemingly bipartisan on Boeing. There is still a long way to go to bring an effective safety culture back to Boeing. The flying public is also acutely worried about why pieces of Boeing airplanes are falling from the sky. Senators also said that they've heard from other, other whistleblowers who have yet to come forward. Boeing uh, making this statement in regards to what happened yesterday and all of the comments uh, in that hearing. Boeing says uh, it insists we continue to put safety and quality above all else and share information transparently with our regulator, that's the FAA, along with customers and other stakeholders. But the problem here, Savannah, is this company has been in the firing line 
for years now, and its problems seem to grow worse by the week, by the day, as you've got more whistleblowers who, according to members of Congress, are prepared to come forward. Back mm. to you. Wow. All right, Tom Costello, important reporting. Thank you so much. We've got much more to come here on this hour of Morning News Now, including President Biden's new push for higher tariffs on some Chinese metals. But what would that mean for the average American? We are watching your wallet for you in just a moment. First, though, Prince William is back on the job this morning, officially returning to public duties for the first time since Princess Kate went public with her cancer diagnosis. We've got more on that up next. We are back with the latest on the race to the White House. Former President Trump is due back in a courtroom today for the continuation of jury selection in his hush money criminal trial. And with Mr. Trump tied up in court, his rival, President Biden, was calling for higher tariffs on Chinese steel while campaigning in the swing state of Pennsylvania yesterday. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has more. Courting union members in Battleground, Pennsylvania, President Biden is calling for the tripling of tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum. I'm not looking for a fight with China. I'm looking for competition, but fair competition. The administration accuses China of overproducing goods and flooding the U.S. market, hurting the American economy. China denies it. President Biden has kept most of the tariffs on China that the Trump White House first imposed. Former President Trump has pledged even higher tariffs if he wins. My predecessor and the MAGA Republicans want to cross the board tariffs on all imports from all countries that could badly hurt American consumers. The president is focusing on economic issues during a three-day trip through a crucial swing state while his opponent is tied up in court. A new poll shows 64 percent of Americans approve of how Mr. Trump handled the economy, while 63 percent disapprove of President Biden on the issue. Joe Padovan, a retired steel worker, blames corporate greed, not President Biden, for inflation. I really do believe that uh, the Constitution is going to take a step backwards if um, Mr. Trump gets in. He supports the president's push for more tariffs on China. What we need to do is be building in America. Well, I paid a tariff that you can build it here. But in Scranton, Trump supporter John Basiliga is building a new restaurant, and he's slamming President Biden for rising costs. He says his policies are better for, for middle America or anybody. Just walk around and ask the real people. They'll tell you the exact opposite. With jury selection and former President Trump's trial set to resume on Thursday, the Biden campaign is heading to Philadelphia, trying to create a split screen moment. Back to you. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much. So let's talk more about President Biden's economic policies with NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung, fresh off quite the reporting trip. Yep, in China. In China, yep, which is pretty cool. Following exactly you'll, these threads. Exactly, you'll tell us more about this. So first off, just help us to understand how these tariffs work, why President Biden wants to do this in the first place, and then we'll get into how it's going to impact us at home. Yeah, well, with the specific tariffs uh, on steel and aluminum, basically right now they're about 7.5% on whatever Chinese, China is trying to import to the United States. Uh, President Biden wants to uh, triple that, and that's a big mm -hmm. deal because that means that essentially any steel that'd be coming in from China would be enormously more expensive to bring into this country than it is right now. Now, one thing that is worth noting is that this is going to involve some cooperation from Mexico as well, because the Biden administration is also weary of China trying to export steel into the United States through Mexican channels as well. Mm. So that's why the announcement yesterday also included some uh, mention of Mexico having to basically tie down on their uh, tariffs on Chinese steel as well. So when then President Trump wanted to do something like this, what it sort of resulted in was like this trade war because then China did the same thing back. I mean, are we going to see that again? Well, I mean, here's the thing is that the Biden administration has said before that they are not going to take tariffs on other things off the table. This is really the first one. And as you mentioned, I was in China following uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and she was mentioning that this whole idea of China essentially flooding not just the United States, but other global markets with goods and trying to deliberately lower prices to undercut local competition is happening not just in steel, but it's happening in things like electric vehicles, happening in things like solar panels, happening in things like batteries. So this could be the first step in escalating that war, of course, it depends on whether or not China does anything retaliatory. We have to remember there are global bodies that are in charge of kind of uh, administering and making sure that there is fair trade around the world. That comes from the World Trade Organization. Could they step in at some point? Mm -hmm. That remains an open question. But we're a few months out from an election. You do wonder if this is the first step for the Biden administration to ratchet that up. You also hear that and you're like, OK, that sounds like everything gets more expensive for all of us. Tell us, how will this impact all of us at home? What does this mean for our wallets? What does this mean for things that you might not even be really thinking are connected here, but that you head to the store to buy? 
buy. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is that if you increase tariffs, well, that would increase the price of importing that good, which mm. in this inflationary environment, would that make everything that has steel in it more expensive? Well, not yet, but for a few reasons. First off, what President Biden announced yesterday is a request for the Trade Representative's Office to raise tariffs, not necessarily an immediate directive that's going to take place tomorrow. There's a number of other steps that have to happen before that. And then mm -hmm. secondly, the amount of steel that's imported into the United States represents about 0.6% of U.S. demand. So mm. for the most part, okay. the steel that we have here domestically is either domestically produced or brought in from other countries that are in China. So it's not necessarily the case mm. that, okay, these tariffs are going to make everything that has steel more expensive, but certainly worth watching. Right. Well, that's some good news there to hear. All right, Brian Chung, again, fresh off his trip. Great to have you back. And yep. perfect story for you to report on for us. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Well, changing gears, Prince William is set to make his official return to public duties today for the first time since his wife, Princess Kate, announced she's being treated for cancer. The prince is scheduled to visit West London and nearby Surrey and focus on the environment. NBC News International correspondent Molly Hunter joins us from Buckingham Palace with the latest. Hi, Molly. Good morning. Savannah, good morning from a sunny Buckingham Palace for once. That's right. Prince William is back to work. We have already seen him out and about today, and he is now looking forward to his royal duties and supporting his family. Take a look. This morning, Prince William is back at work. His first public engagement since his wife Kate, the Princess of Wales' bombshell health announcement last month. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. This week, William and Kate's kids now back at school after the Easter holidays. The Wales family often spends school breaks at their country house in Norfolk. It was very restful. It was very quiet. Usually they're a very busy, active family. One of Kate's favorite things to do in Norfolk is to take the family sailing. Um, I don't think there was any of that this time around. As Kate undergoes preventative cancer treatment, the family has requested privacy, hunkering down just the five of them. That as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. They've mostly stayed out of the public eye, but last week, William spotted with eldest son George cheering on their favorite soccer team. While Prince Harry, a world away, making headlines this morning, registering his permanent address in California and speaking at a travel conference yesterday. Uh, for us, communities is the people and the places. Meanwhile, back here, Kate still recuperating. I'm told by palace sources that at the moment, she's not working from home. The focus is on her treatment. Kensington Palace only saying she'll restart her public-facing royal duties when she feels ready. Earlier this week, a hint at business as usual, a statement from both the prince and princess following the horrific stabbing attacks in Australia. And with family milestones coming up, we may hear more from the Wales family next week when little Louis turns six, perhaps another Kate family photo to mark the day. At the end of April, William and Kate celebrating their 13th wedding anniversary. And looking ahead, Trooping the Color looms large on the calendar in mid-June, an event the whole family usually attends. And if we're lucky, little Louis steals the show. If we're lucky, Savannah, lots to look ahead to. Now, there's no timeline on Kate, the Princess of Wales' return. We know she's eager to get back. But the palace also says when she does come back, it may be sporadic, so not to read too much into those early events. Another thing to look forward to, though, next month, Prince Harry, Savannah, likely to be on this side of the pond for an Invictus Games ceremony in early May. Savannah? We'll have to see how that works out with the whole family. Molly, thank you so much for the latest there. Let's get you more international news now. The U.S. is reimposing sanctions on Venezuela's oil industry. Megan Fitzgerald joins us with that and more. Hey, Megan, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. That's right. It comes as a response to uh, President the Venezuela's President Maduro's failure to allow for an inclusive and competitive election. Now, uh, the U.S. says that Venezuela didn't stick to the commitments made. Last year, Maduro agreed to hold such elections, so the U.S. Treasury issued a temporary authorization to allow transaction of oil and gas without sanctions, but that agreement is set to expire tomorrow. In an attempt to combat mass tourism, Amsterdam will no longer allow new hotels 
hotels to be built. The city says it will only be possible if another hotel closes, but it can't have more rooms than the building it will replace. Government officials say they want to keep the city livable for both residents and tourists. And a pretty cool story out of England, a father and daughter duo discovered that uh, what may be the largest marine reptile to swim on Earth. Justin and his 11-year-old daughter, Ruby Reynolds, discovered this gigantic jawbone on a beach in 2020. They continued searching, finding more pieces over the course of two years. The bones belong to the species of the giant Icatheus. And they say that this is the largest thing that ever swam in the seas. And it's comparable, they say, uh, to a blue whale. Savannah. Wow, pretty amazing. Megan Fitzgerald, thank you so much. Well, coming up, America's obsession with a new generation of weight loss drugs is now causing a supply chain squeeze. When we return, how one major drug maker is working to keep up with a boom in demand as shortages plague patients from coast to coast. This is Morning News Now. We are back with new developments in the case against the man accused of killing those four University of Idaho students. In a court filing Wednesday, attorneys for the suspect offered up an alibi, saying in part that Brian Koberger was out driving alone the night the students were killed. Here's NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett with the details. Hey there, good morning. The whole point of an alibi is to raise some reasonable doubt in the minds of a jury to suggest that the defendant was someplace else so he couldn't have committed the crime. But in this case, the alibi that's being offered by the defense, raising more questions than answers. This morning, a fresh look at Brian Koberger's defense strategy. His lawyers revealing in a long-awaited court filing they will offer expert testimony to cast doubt on prosecutors' evidence placing Koberger near the crime scene. Pointing to his fondness for nighttime drives, his public defender now says that, quote, Mr. Koberger was out driving in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, as he often did to hike and run and or see the moon and the stars. It's the very same defense that the judge appeared skeptical of last year when his public defender first floated it. Prosecutors allege that Koberger fatally stabbed Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin in their off-campus home near the University of Idaho. Authorities zeroing in on Koberger using cell phone towers to track the location of his phone and surveillance video allegedly showing a white Hyundai matching his vehicle casing the victim's house on the night of the killings and the morning after. This is State of Idaho versus Brian Koberger. In the newly released court documents, Koberger's legal team now says his phone did not travel east on the Moscow Pullman Highway in the early morning hours of November 13th and thus could not be the vehicle captured on video along the Moscow Pullman Highway. The judge entered a plea of not guilty on Koberger's behalf, but this morning the case is stalled in unresolved pretrial motions with no trial date. Kaylee Gonzalez's family saying in a statement they're frustrated by the delays, while their attorney says it's striking just how little information has been shared with the families. The line of communication between the prosecution and the victim's family, at least for the Gonzalez family, has been very limited. I've never seen it before in my career. Well, the next court hearing in this case is currently scheduled for May 14th. Back to you. All right, Laura, thank you so much. Well, Eli Lilly's announcement that its drug ZetBound may improve sleep apnea is expected to add to the huge and growing demand for the weight loss medication. So can the drug makers keep up? NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans joins us with the latest details on this. Hey, Christine, good morning. Good morning. You know, that's right. The big problem that Eli Lilly is facing right now is, is a shortage of this drug. Both ZetBound and Manjaro, which is used for diabetes, are increasingly hard to find at the moment. Thousands, tens of thousands of people really across the country not able to get their prescribed dosage and that could last for months. All across the country, America's relationship with weight loss is undergoing a dramatic transformation as drugs like Ozempic, Wagovi, Mount Jaro, and Zebbound are changing the game. Their popularity is exploding, with sales soaring over $11 billion in 2023 compared to about $4 billion the year before. And now demand is exceeding the supply. Here in North Carolina, a multi-billion dollar all hands on deck push to churn out Manjaro for diabetes and Zebbound for weight loss. 
a massive investment to bring injectables from this brand new Eli Lilly site to your pharmacy. So people, consumers out there who, are, who really are eager for these drugs will see product from here at their pharmacies in the spring, in January. And sometime next year. For sometime sure, yeah. next year. Not soon enough for the nearly 80,000 people now taking ZepBound in a shortage just five months after being approved by the FDA. It's the drug some Wall Street analysts say could drive the weight loss drug market to $100 billion a year. Is that a function of just demand that is so great for these drugs that you're really scrambling to keep up? It is the demand that's causing this. And again, we, we, we are working so hard every day to make sure that we increase that capacity as fast as we can to get these medications in patients' hands. Amanda Chella says this new class of GLP-1 weight loss drugs has changed her life. It has been a game changer. Food noise is unrelenting. Um, it's when right. all of your thoughts just completely revolve around food. And the GLP-1 medications, they, they shut it off like a switch for me. And I feel, I feel free. I feel like I'm no longer ruled by food anymore. I feel like I can just live my life. I feel normal. And with the Zepbound shortage, I'm just, I'm not willing to struggle again. I'm not willing to suffer again. But it's become a part-time job to fill her prescription. I just Googled Walmart pharmacy in New Jersey. And I just went down the list and I called every single Walmart in the state of New Jersey. Nobody had it. So then I started focusing on Pennsylvania, Philadelphia specifically. No one had it there either. I tried a few mom and pop shops. I've tried hospital pharmacies. I could not find it within the state of New Jersey. When do you think Zepbound will be in, uh, you know, more better supply? For the near term, we are going to be in this limited availability, which may cause delays across some of the doses for both Monjaro and Zepbound. Um, outside of near term, Karen, it's very challenging to right. predict when you know it's going to be full on. So I would say that um, just for the near term, we are expecting limited availability. But thousands of patients, like Amanda, facing the risk of having to start all over again months down the road. All right, these drugs are not simple to use. You have to start at an initial starter dose, then you work your way up to what's called a therapeutic dose. And if that dosage laps, if you can't get it, mm -hmm. right, you have to start all over again at the beginning. Wow. Uh, people who aren't able to find their dose should talk to their doctor about what other alternatives there are. But people like Amanda, I mean, she's, it is a full-time job. Part-time job to full-time job for her, chasing down what she to thinks find it. is a life-changing and life-saving drug in her case. Yeah, pretty interesting to hear her talk about that food noise. Yeah. I'd never heard it put that way. Um, and yet, even though they're yeah. so difficult to actually find, we're hearing about more potential uses for them and maybe even meeting more people that are looking for them with Eli Lilly pointing to what it's doing potentially for sleep apnea. Yeah, it had some late stage results and a couple of different tests that it had that showed that it was really had good uses for sleep apnea. And that sometimes can be weight related. So you're starting to see all of these things where addressing the weight issue has these other consequences that are really important for health. They're going to later this year, in the middle of this year, they're going to present that to regulators around the world um, and to uh, and to um, try to get it, you know, get that uh, on the on the road to being something you can prescribe this drug mm -hmm. for. But again, you can't get it, you know, like right. not everybody can get it. So it's just more demand for something. You know, I was in that factory. They are working hard. They're being careful. You want to be safe. Yeah. But they know that there's big demand for this. And they've, they're have they standing up an entire factory yeah. just to churn out these two drugs, hopefully hitting market by next year. Right. And but even then, not until next year. Okay. All right. Christine Romans, nice thank you so you. much. Great interview. Financial headlines starting with the latest read on unemployment. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that breaking news. And while other financial headlines, hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. We are getting a fresh look of the economy. The number of Americans filing for jobless benefits didn't change last week as the labor market continues to defy efforts by the Federal Reserve to cool hiring. The Labor Department reporting that initial claims for the week of April 13th remains unchanged at 212,000 claims. All right, United Airlines said Wednesday that Boeing will pay for any financial damages that the carrier incurred in the first quarter as a result of the grounding of the 737 MAX 9 aircraft. 
U.S. regulators grounded some Boeing planes in January to undergo safety checks after a cabin panel blowout on an Alaska Airlines flight. The move forced United Airlines to temporarily suspend all of its 737 MAX 9 fleet, resulting in a $200 million loss for the airline in Q1. United said Boeing will pay with credit memos for future purchases. Red Lobster is considering whether to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Bloomberg reports the seafood chain is getting advice on restructuring from outside lawyers. Red Lobster is looking to shed some long-term contract and renegotiate several leases. The company has been weighed down by rising costs for labor and real estate, Savannah. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, now let's get to a new scandal rocking the NBA. The league has issued a rare lifetime ban for the Toronto Raptors player, John Tay Porter, accusing him of gambling violations. Here's NBC News correspondent Sam Brock with the story. The NBA is doling out a lifetime ban to Raptors forward John Tay Porter Jr. after a league investigation uncovered blatant violations of our gaming rules. Porter is accused of manipulating his own performance and tipping off betters, which Commissioner Adam Silver commented on days ago. It's cardinal sin, you know, that, that what he's accused of in the NBA. Porter is the first active player or coach expelled from the league for gambling in 70 years. Adam Silver had no choice but to drop the hammer today. According to a league investigation, Porter placed at least 13 bets on NBA games, netting about $22,000 shared confidential information about his own health status to a known NBA better and limited his own game participation to influence the outcome of bets tied to his performance. He then gets into a game against the Sacramento Kings and within three minutes takes himself out saying that he's sick. He only played three minutes. He didn't take shots. He didn't get rebounds. So he underperforms. They win the bet. NBC News was unable to reach Porter for comment. The rush of attention around professional sports leagues and gambling. Bet all the stars with all your friends. Has coincided with those same leagues going into business with the gambling companies. How are we going to integrate gambling into professional sports while simultaneously making sure that the players aren't gambling? It's the most important thing. But what he did speaks to the heart of why this is such a bad idea to have leagues partner with gambling companies. A new terrain that leagues like the NBA must now navigate. Sam Brock, NBC News. Coming up, finding love in darkness after the break, the true-to-life story of two Holocaust survivors who fell in love during one of history's greatest tragedies. It's told in a new series on Peacock called The Tattooist of Auschwitz, and its star, Jonah Howard King, joins us next. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. Well, legendary director Martin Scorsese has teased a new project that's getting a lot of attention. Variety reports that he wants to make a biopic of Frank Sinatra and is actually looking to cast Leonardo DiCaprio as the singer. This would be the pair's seventh film collaboration. He also reportedly wants Jennifer Lawrence to play Sinatra's second wife, Ava Gardner. Variety reports that Scorsese is also looking at making a film about Jesus, although it's not clear who he has in mind for that role. So something we will keep our eyes on. Big news there. Well, it's been nearly 80 years since the end of the Holocaust, but the harrowing stories that came out of that dark time are still making their way to light. One of those stories is the focus of a new Peacock series. It's called The Tattooist of Auschwitz. It was inspired by the real-life story of Jewish Holocaust survivors Lali and Gita Sokolov, who met and fell in love in the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camps. Every time I open my eyes, I am still there. You have to find something in your mind. A good thing. You can't get there. I found something there. Someone. Well, this morning we are so lucky to be joined by Jonah Howard King, who plays Lolly in this. Jonah, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. I mean, even just this trailer is emotional. It totally had me tearing up. Tell me about you first learning this story, because again, it's pretty incredible. This is a real story. This is really based on something that happened. Tell me about yeah. hearing about it and then deciding to take on this role. Yes, I heard about it uh, when the book came out originally. Heather Morris uh, had spent a lot of time with Lali over the years and, and had written his, his story, and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with um, him and his humanity and his uh, commitment to Gita and their love story, and I found it to be such a 
extraordinary thing that a love could uh, could come about in in that context. And so, um, yeah, when I heard that they were making it into a into a show, I really wanted to be involved. What was that like learning about someone who was this real man who went through something such as this? And, and taking him on, trying to, you know, do that role justice. What was that process like? That's exactly it. I think it, it definitely feels like a huge responsibility. Mm. I think any time there's a much-loved book, I think you feel that, but particularly yeah. when you're telling a story of a life that has been lived. And in this context, I think you want so much to make sure that it's dealt with sensitively and respectfully mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and make sure that the, the story is being done justice. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I believe, if you wouldn't mind sharing, there's a bit of a personal connection just in, in what your grandparents went through. Yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. me that. Yeah, so my, I was looking at the documents just this morning that uh, mm. a cousin of mine who worked in a museum and has access to all of these archive records that he sent me, and it's the, uh, it's the, the documents of, of when he came from, from Poland at the end of the 20s and came over to Canada and then to America, which is where my mum grew up. But it was amazing because he left and, uh, and he was sort of sandwiched in between the, the Russian pogroms and then what was to come. Uh, in Nazi Germany, and um, and they were able to leave and, and build a new life. But I felt very connected to to this part of history, I guess, as as a result. How emotional was that? Kind of tapping into something that your own family dealt with. It was, it was, and it felt very personal. It felt very intimate. And I think, again, I think we wanted so much to to make sure that this story was being handled delicately. We knew it was an important story to tell, but at the same time, I think making sure that we were. Um, being respectful to Lale specifically and everyone um, who has a story like Lale's or similar to his because there's so much um, there's so much trauma connected to this time and so I think we wanted to make sure that we looked after it. Absolutely. What was it like to tell a love story in a place like that? Yeah, it was something that drew me to it. I think it's such a unique thing um, and a unique aspect of this story. We wanted so much not to dilute any mm. of the horror that had happened, yeah. but also celebrate the fact that two people had been able to find each other. They were able to survive and spend the rest of their lives together. So we really wanted to, to highlight that. And I think we were very inspired by their ability to give love and receive love uh, in a place like that. It, it felt for us like it was an act of defiance. Mm, absolutely. I'm so happy we could share that. I didn't know if that was just something I knew secret already, that they survive and live together, which is just, no, which is yeah, just such absolutely. a beautiful part they, of the story. They, they, they spent the rest of their days together and, yeah. and, and they had a child and it was a, mm. you know, a beautiful ending to a, a very dark time. A story like this related to the Holocaust, it's coming at at a tough time right now in the world. And actually, I, I want to read a stat. According to the Anti-Defamation League, anti-Semitic incidents in the, US, in the U.S. reached a record high last year, up 140% from 2022. What does it mean for you to put art out about a time like that at a time like this right now in the world? It feels very important. You don't really get the opportunity to do this where you feel like you're telling a story that has so much meaning and goes so much further than just a job. I think... For us, this is very living history. Mm. Um, victims, perpetrators, they're still alive today, but that won't be the case. And so we feel like it's really important to keep remembering these stories, to keep telling them, honoring the lives that were lost, honoring the lives that uh, survived as well. And I think ultimately the story is, I think fundamentally it's a, it's a show about advocating for humanity mm. and, and for peace. And I think we, we need that at, at this time. Absolutely, so much so. Jonah Howard King, thank you so much for Thanks coming. For thank you. you for sharing the show. It's really, really incredible to see. You can check this out. It's the Tattoo of Auschwitz. It's streaming on Peacock starting May 2nd. So we're getting a little sneak preview. Thank you for coming by. We really appreciate it. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Don't go anywhere, though. The news continues on Morning News Now, right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.